Again, I'm Emily Cranston, and I'm an associate professor at the University of British Columbia in Canada. Um, my research group is the Sustainable Nanobiocomposites Group, um, and it really is my great pleasure to share with you today some of our past work and a few ongoing projects around the surface modification of cellulose nanocrystals. And you know, we have really enjoyed working in this space, both because you know, surface chemistry and all the different ways to change the surface is pretty fun, uh, but ultimately it's because we wanna be able to tailor cellulose nanocrystals and their interactions with their environment. And so if we do that, we believe that we can expand the potential range of applications for these materials. Um, but I'd like to just start out by first inviting you all to, to Vancouver and to come and visit and study at, at UBC, University of British Columbia. Um, we're located in Vancouver and routinely ranked among one of the best cities to live and one of the best universities to do research at. And it, it is truly a spectacular city. Um, when we're not in the lab, um, you can more or less ski, kayak, golf, and hike all in the same day. And it is a, a city where the grass stays green all year round. So uh, we hope you will come and visit and work and play. Uh, in the next two years, we're hosting a number of big conferences here um, related to um, pulp and paper, fibers, nanocellulose, uh, and chemical engineering. So we hope that you'll keep an eye out for some of those events. And of course, uh, UBC, the campus is located on the ocean. We have views of the mountains in most directions and world-class researchers and facilities. And one of those uh, is the Bioproducts Institute um, that I am really lucky to be a part of. And so the Bioproducts Institute with UBC, along with KTH and TreeSearch and Alto University and FinSeries uh, in Helsinki and Finland and AMPA in Switzerland make up what we call the Boreal Alliance. And so as we develop this new Boreal Alliance, um, we're looking for new collaborations, new um, research exchange and student exchange. And we hope that we'll have a lot more opportunities uh, to work with many of you included in the webinar today. And so um, I'm familiar with the fact that, that many people listening uh, are interested in different kinds of lignocellulosic materials. And I think this is a, a fun way to sort of look at these materials where we can plot the length on the y-axis and the aspect ratio here on the x-axis. And for those interested in looking at pulp fibers, of course, they're much bigger, but they tend to actually have a similar aspect ratio to the main material that I'm focusing on today. And so this today, we're just going to focus on cellulose nanocrystals, or these whiskers or needles of cellulose. Um, they tend to be you know, about 100 to 200 nanometers long and about 5, 10, 5 nanometers in cross section. So aspect ratio is around 30. Um, and essentially the reason that I'm focusing on this is because it's the material that I worked with since early on in my PhD, but we're really interested in other kinds of nanocellulose and, and even you know, cellulose filaments and pulp fibers as well. Um, but just for the sake of today's talk, I wanted to highlight that I'm focusing on on these materials, which are made by chemical methods, so either by sulfuric acid hydrolysis or oxidation to get really highly crystalline uh, materials. And if we talk a little bit more, what are some of these interesting properties of cellulose nanocrystals or CNCs? Um, of course, the, their morphology and their surface area is pretty important um, because when we make them, we remove the, the less ordered cellulose and they're highly crystalline. So they're polymer crystals, if you want. Um, where the polymer chains are all aligned in the same direction. But because of that, we get a material with pretty impressive mechanical properties. Of course, we all know the bio-based and renewable resource and, and non-toxic with ongoing research to show this and show that these materials might be used in cosmetic and pharmaceutical and maybe edible products. Um, when we make our CNCs, from sulfuric acid hydrolysis. We graft sulfate half ester groups on the surface. And so that imparts a negative charge and that makes them colloidally stable. So that really helps to have these materials in water and to be able to dry them in different ways and put them back in water and redisperse easily. And that's really an advantage for cellulose nanocrystals over other forms of nanocellulose, but quite frankly, over a lot of other nanomaterials. So this redispersible from dry I think is pretty important. Another thing um, for a natural and organic material, we can say that 
uh, cellulose nanocrystals are, are pretty chemically and thermally stable. Um, they have some amphiphilic properties. Interestingly, they align in external electromagnetic fields. And if we dry them down carefully under controlled conditions, we can get um, bright colored iridescent pigments. So we can get some pretty interesting optical properties. Um, but all of these properties here really require us to have well dispersed and well defined materials. And so that's a little bit hinting at why surface modification might be needed in some applications. So I tend to sort of summarize the three main advantages of working with these cellulose nanocrystals um, being their extremely high surface area to volume ratio and large aspect ratio. And the fact that they're great at reinforcing materials or rheologically modifying liquids. And they're ideal for stabilizing interfaces, for example, uh, oil water interfaces, and in some cases, water air interfaces, or for dispersing other materials that might not be as colloidally stable as the CNCs themselves. But to get these properties, we need to have our CNCs well dispersed, so non aggregated. And it's imperative that they're highly compatible with their environment. And that environment might be a liquid environment or it might be a solid environment like a polymer matrix, for example. Um, and as I hope most people uh, listening today know, cellulose is, is hydrophilic and tends to you know, really like to interact with water. So in lots of cases, we can see that as an advantage from a green perspective and water is easy and cheap to work in. But in a lot of cases, we want to be able to put nanocellulose into organic solvents or into hydrophobic polymers. Um, and this is where some problems arise and especially agglomeration can occur and can really quickly sort of get rid of this nano advantage altogether if we just have a clump of material sitting at the bottom of the beaker. So in my group, um, our research tends to fall into one of these categories uh, listed on the slide, where we're really looking at structure property relationships, or essentially trying to link particle chemistry and functionality and develop the design rules. So that means we spend a fair amount of time looking at ways to break down biomass and produce nanocellulose and cellulose nanocrystals with different surface chemistry based on the way that we make them. Then we like to do activation, functionalization, or surface modification, the focus of today's talk. Um, and then we take these materials and we build them back up, hopefully into interesting new structures um, with a range of new material and applications in mind. And so my research group aims to establish cellulose or nanocellulose as a material platform um, by bridging the gap between industrial producers of nanocellulose and end users or uh, potential um, potential um, new commercial receptors of this new technology. Um, and our idea is, of course, that we want to be able to create new science and technology to produce new markets for wood pulp and biomass. And so we're fairly uh, you know, focused on strategic industries um, and forest industry being one of them, but looking at applications of cellulose nanocrystals in, in biomedical devices, in food, in cosmetics, looking at energy devices and environment applications, uh, paints and coatings and adhesives, and also using nanocellulose for water treatment or water purification. But in order to develop uh, nanocellulose into any of these materials or for new bio products, the key is to tailor interfaces and the interfacial interaction. So it keeps coming back to this surface chemistry. I wanted to highlight that my group has also spent a fair amount of time on benchmarking of lab made and industrially produced cellulose nanocrystals. So early on in 2017, and now again recently as there are new commercial players um, producing cellulose nanocrystals anywhere from kilogram to ton per day capacity. Um, we've also worked with a large group of researchers to produce this um, review on characterization of nanocellulose, uh, which is very long, and I recommend you only read it a section at a time as you need it. Um, but the idea was to have suggestions and guidelines for characterization, you know, so that we can really communicate about what kind of materials we're working with, how we've characterized them. And I think that ultimately it's really, really important that we have a known starting material. 
So we want to know where we're starting. And especially if we're going to then go and do surface modification, we need to know where we're starting so that once we've modified and we characterize again, we know where we are. And so um, to me, this is crucial if we're actually going to move forward and especially if we're going to talk about scaling up any of these surface modification routes. So moving on um, to talk about surface modification, uh, I really like to work in water. And so I, I mentioned working in water is great because it's you know more sustainable and water is cheap and we're pretty familiar with water and cellulose likes water. So ideally we would work on nanocellulose that was not surface modified. But if we have to modify the surface, let's try and do these reactions in water. And so today, most of the examples that I show you are water-based reactions. Um, we are, of course, not the first people to work on surface modification of nanocellulose. And I'm just highlighting a few reviews here that have nice sections talking about the full range of potential and different routes to modify nanocellulose. I just wanna talk about a few today um, that sort of fall into these categories that are highlighted here on the top. So when we make our CNCs um, with sulfuric acid hydrolysis, they have sulfate half ester groups on the surface, so negative surface charges. So we can go and we can coat them or we can absorb polymers onto the surface um, or we can absorb um, moieties that have opposite charge. Uh, we can graft polymers to or from the surface and we can change the counter ion or the surface charge on our CNCs as well. So those are sort of the three general routes that I'll talk about. So again, why do we want to surface functionalize? And the truth is that from an industrial perspective and from a cellulose being happy perspective, probably we don't want to surface functionalize. And so in my group, we do a lot of work where we have not modified the nanocellulose and we use CNCs exactly as they are produced. But we might want to functionalize or modify the surface to improve their compatibility, as I said, with a range of liquids and solid environments. Uh, we might want a surface modified to impart new function or to impart, for example, responsive behavior. I also mentioned that CNCs have a negative charge on the surface, and so that means that their colloidal stability is imparted by electrostatics. But that can be a problem if we're working in high ionic strength media, for example. And so we might want to modify the surface in order to impart steric stability or another mechanism for stability. But overall, the goal is to make materials that are predictable. And so when we work with CNCs in water, they are predictable and we understand what we're going to get. We know how to process them and we can predict out the outcome and the properties. But if we're going to work in an organic solvent, for example, or in a melted polymer, we start to lose the ability to predict, especially if agglomeration is happening and if our material is changing over time. So that's really the main reason that surface modification becomes crucial is to ensure predictability and to be sure that we don't have agglomeration, we don't have processing issues, we don't end up with weak materials where we have interfaces between cellulose and their environment that are incompatible. So some of the challenges in surface modification is that um, we really want to keep this uh, needle shape. So we don't want to, to mess up the morphology of our cellulose nanocrystals. We want to avoid agglomeration. Um, we don't really want to work in organic media, both from a sustainability perspective, but basically because when you put CNCs in organic media, they all clump together and then you just modifying the outside of a big chunk and that's not particularly helpful. Uh, we want to avoid things like multi, uh, multi step solvent exchange processes. We want to be sure that when we've modified the CNCs, we can still redisperse them. So I highlighted that being able to dry the materials in different ways and put them back in water is particularly important. And so uh, in our experience, a lot of the time when we've modified CNCs and then gone through a drying process, we've found that we now have an intractable material that doesn't redisperse anymore. So that's really something to watch out for. And so I've highlighted that the hydrophilic nature of CNCs makes it easy to work with them in water, but more difficult to work in nonpolar or hydrophobic uh, environments. And so that means that making hydrophobic CNCs is pretty high on our uh, wish list of, of service modifications to be able to carry out. But 
if we want to work with CNCs in water and we want to make them hydrophobic, the moieties that we're sticking onto the surface are probably not water soluble. So that's sort of a catch 22 from the beginning. And then I've highlighted the last two because these are ones that I do think tend to get overlooked, but purifying nanomaterials is really tricky. And I think that like, you know, we've gone through and we've done multiple steps and we're never really sure if we've fully purified. And I think we have to, because otherwise we don't know what we have and the characterization can be interpreted in different ways. So being able to characterize fully is important, but it only works if you've also purified fully. And so that's just my, my you know, mini rant on, on things that sometimes get overlooked and some of the challenges that face us when we try to do uh, modified materials. So we've developed this toolbox of surface modifications. I only have a time to talk about a few of them today. Uh, but for example, um, fluorescently labeling cellulose nanocrystals, attaching polymers or copolymers, uh, imparting cross-linkable sites, changing the surface chemistry to have phosphate groups or sulfate groups or a combination of polysaccharide or sugar coating, imparting um, more uh, carboxylic acid groups so that we can do carbodiamide coupling. And as you can, I don't know if you can hear my baby yelling in the background, I'm really sorry. <laughs> ah. And, you know, high on the list is trying to make hydrophobic CNCs. So that's just a few examples. Um, so when it comes to purification, um, we tend to work a lot using uh, stirred cell dialysis or ultrafiltration. Um, we need to do this so that we can try to be clear on what is bound material versus unbound material or unreacted reactants. We really need to remove those in order for char characterization to work. Um, I think that um, some other methods, so dialysis is pretty good, but we often ask ourselves, when do we need to dialyze against purified water versus tap water? Uh, if we use centrifugation as a purification method, um, this one might be a little bit um, guilty of sort of trapping unreacted things in between the cellulose nanocrystals. Again, getting stuck with bound and unbound or free and bound material. Um, we can use various kinds of ion exchange resin. And uh, one thing that we've found works particularly well is that if we purify and then sonicate to redisperse our material and then purify again, that actually really helps to try to see trends in material behavior. So this sonication step is basically to untrap stuff and then go through the purification again. So that's a, a few suggestions in terms of purification and also questions that we don't always know the answer to and it changes with different surface chemistries. And so uh, again, I mentioned this characterization review, which has an entire section and this flow chart on how to characterize nanocellulose once it's been surface modified. And again, we have a, a, a large number of surface modification of characterization tools we can use from spectroscopy, microscopy, elemental analysis, and then a lot of work around wettability, titrations to look at surface charge. Um, what ability and um, surface tension being particularly important when we're trying to make more hydrophobic or surface active materials. And I also wanted to mention that we have done some work developing um, a solid state NMR technique um, using ionic liquids in order to be able to determine polymer graph density and graph length from CNCs. And that work was done in collaboration with Alistair King at the University of Helsinki. So going back to, to my list of sort of nano advantages and, and why working with CNCs is great. Um, and I made this table of key properties um, and asked myself sort of when we do surface modification, are we changing this property and do we want it to change? And so if we start with the morphology, high surface area, high aspect ratio, needle shaped material, there's a very good chance that surface modification will change this, and we don't want to. This is one of the key properties we want to preserve. We know that when we have CNCs in, in suspension, that they can be great rheological modifiers, and changing the surface modification almost always changes its rheological properties, and depending on what we want to use it for, we may or may not want that. When we look at the turbidity of the suspension, modification, again, always changes turbidity. Most cases, we do not want that. 
And what about having a nice dry white powder when we've dried the materials? Surface modification will affect that too. And for most applications, people are not interested in having off-colored materials. Uh, in the case of sulfuric acid hydrolyzed or sulfated CNCs, um, that sulfur content is important. So the charge is important for colloidal stability. Uh, the sulfur, sulfur might be used as a chemical handle um, or may have some other functionality. And so some surface modification routes are going to strip off that surface charge or change the sulfur content. And whether that happens and if it matters really depends on what your goals are. Suspension pH always changes when you do surface modification. And then depending on your application, that might be acceptable or not. And for example, in biomedical um, and pharmaceutical type applications, this could be a real problem. We really need to work in a pretty narrow pH range. And then lastly, changing the hydrophilicity, which I said is one of the main reasons we go down surface modification routes. And so we hope that we can do good surface modification to affect this, and we want that to happen. So I try to remember to come back to this table as we're developing new modification routes, asking ourselves, you know, which properties we're changing and is that what we wanted? And sometimes it's a trade-off between one row and another. So if I start by giving examples of some non-covalent surface modification, um, one of the ones that we've played around with a lot is adsorption modification. So we've shown that we can adsorb polymers onto the surface of CNCs, and some of those polymers um, are uncharged polysaccharides. So polymers like methyl cellulose, hydroxyethyl cellulose, locust bean gum, and hydroxypropyl guar, these naturally adhere to, um, to cellulose nanocrystals. We've also looked at hemicelluloses as well, where for the most part, this adsorption is, is known to be an entropically driven adsorption. Uh, we've also done some work um, with charged dye block copolymers, where we have a cationic charge that sticks onto the anionic CNC surface, and the other block can be something that makes the material hydrophobic or that, for example, makes it thermal responsive in the case of a polynipam uh, dye block copolymer. And so we've then gone on to use these materials as in responsive materials and flocculants and some emulsion work, which I'll mention in a minute. Um, but another non-covalent or adsorption-based method is using surfactants. And so again, we can use cationic surfactants like CTAB or DMAB, and depending on the surface coverage and the type of surfactant used, we can really change the properties of surface activity and the contact angle. And so, for example, if this is contact angle as a function of surfactant concentration, we can go from a very hydrophilic material up to a much more hydrophobic material. This is a, a three-phase contact angle as high as about 120. Um, and this is, again, just from coupling surfactants onto the surface. So essentially, we're doing an ion exchange where we exchange the counter ion on the sulfate half ester groups for bulky amphiphilic cations, which are also surfactants. And so the interesting thing here is that we can change our emulsions to have a, a water and oil emulsion where the uh, water is stained, has green in it, or we can actually flip this so we, have, uh, so we have oil and water versus water and oil emulsions. And so we've found that by simple mixing of CNCs with these adsorbing polymers or with this, these electrostatically binding surfactants, that we can then go on to make um, pretty interesting and tailorable emulsions. Uh, pickering emulsions where they're particle stabilized, so the CNCs are at the oil-water interface. And this stands out as having a bunch of advantages um, because these materials are highly surface active. We can make really small stable droplets. And uh, because of the shape here, we make basically a mesh at the interface. And this means you need very little stabilizer or very little CNC to make highly stable um, pickering emulsions. And that's different than if you have close packing of spherical nanoparticles at the interface, for example. So pretty easy way, in water, mix and go, uh, you get surface modified nanomaterials. A second non-covalent uh, modification route that I wanna talk about is something really new that we're still working on, um, but we've shown proof of principle that we can modify the surface of CNCs with oligosaccharides, so with small sugars. 
And in this case, we've started out proof of principle, just showing that we can use phosphated cello oligosaccharides. And the key is playing with solubility. So we want oligosaccharides that are soluble under some conditions, but then precipitate under others. So we're using precipitation as the handle. And we wanna be able to do this during the production of CNCs. So we hope that CNC producers could sort of take their oligosaccharides and dump them in at the right moment during the production process and end up with CNCs with new properties at the end. So we're calling it an in situ precipitation based CNC modification route. And so uh, for those that are familiar with how you make cellulose nanocrystals, it's done you know, in 64 weight percent sulfuric acid. But the way this works is that we would be making our CNCs. And so here they are hydrolyzing. And just before the end of the hydrolysis, we take our oligosaccharides that are acid soluble and we disperse them in sulfuric acid or we dissolve them in sulfuric acid. We then take this bucket of sugars and acid and we pour it in, mix it in with the CNCs and give them just a few minutes to mix. And then we stop the reaction, we stop the hydrolysis with quenching with water. And so this is going to really quickly increase the pH. And we go from the oligosaccharides being soluble in concentrated sulfuric acid to being insoluble as the reaction is quenched. And any oligosaccharides with a degree of polymerization over six are going to be insoluble in water. They therefore precipitate they stick to everything, but since most of the surface area is the CNCs, this results in us now having oligosaccharides attached onto the surface of the cellulose nanocrystals. And we can see that we have pretty good surface coverage um, and that the adsorption or the um, precipitation tends to result in crystallized uh, oligosaccharides on the surface. So they co-crystallize and sort of follow uh, the crystal structure of the cellulose. And so, as I mentioned, we've only done this as proof of principle at this stage. We use phosphated oligosaccharides. Um, and just by doing that, by tuning the degree of polymerization of the oligosaccharide and the amount that we add in, um, we can tune the rheological properties, the water binding ability, the surface charge density, um, and ultimately the surface chemistry of our CNCs. And now the plan really is to design um, some more interesting oligosaccharides in order to impart a whole range of new surface chemistry, hydrophobicity, steric stabilization, um, and some of the things that I mentioned before. Um, but again, the key to this is solubility, and then it's not an absorption, it's a precipitation of the material. And so we think this is pretty interesting because it doesn't require harsh chemicals or have any post-production uh, cleanup because basically everything precipitates onto the CNCs or goes to the bottom of the vial. Um, and we think that this will be fairly easy to scale up and like I said, adaptable to other designer oligosaccharides. So that's uh, our, what we're working on now. So uh, moving on to some covalent surface modification routes, um, we have looked at attaching fluorophores as well as quantum dots onto CNCs. Um, in this case, I wanted to highlight that we could use fluorescein derivatives and modify cellulose nanocrystals in water in one step. Um, but what we found was that the surface charge of the CNCs made a big difference on the efficiency of the reaction. And essentially, the less charged the CNCs were, the more fluorophore we could attach, right? And we also didn't see that trend until we extensively purified. So there's a lot, a lot of non-specifically bound dye when we try and follow these modification routes that I want to warn people about that we purified until we were sure we had removed all the unbound dye. And then we purified three more times, and it wasn't until then that able to see um, some of these trends in terms of charge and, and, uh, and uh, coupling efficiency. And just for example, we'd use these fluorescently dyed CNCs um, in some composites to be able to track where the CNCs are in some electrospun fibers. And then more recently in some in vivo work where we look at bioaccumulation and biodistribution of cellulose nanocrystals uh, in animal models. Another covalent modification here um, is based on using plant polyphenols, so tannic acid, um, which is shown here on the right. And we use this sort of as a, a primer layer 
And again, this is all done in water. So a one-step green hydrophobic modification route for CNCs. The CNCs are in water. We add tannic acid, which sort of gives them a, a patchy coating. Um, but it's the catechol groups here that bind to cellulose. But even when they've done that, there's free catechol groups pointing up in the other direction. So then we go and we add our hydrophobe, which in this case was a water-soluble desylamine. And that reacts with the other side of the tannic acid to instantly make a very hydrophobic material that floats to the top and can be sort of skimmed off and dried. Uh, here you can see this color change that I alluded to before. Um, but essentially, we now have a dried, fairly hydrophobic material that easily redisperses in toluene. And when I say hydrophobic, we still only got a contact angle of around 70. So I guess it's actually just less hydrophilic. Um, but in theory, we can use this route to, to basically add any kind of amine or um, thiol material um, and use this where the tannic acid is sort of the, the primer layer. Um, another example here uh, of covalent modification of CNCs is making them cross-linkable. And so we did this um, through a sodium periodate oxidation to impart aldehyde groups onto the surface. Um, and a tempo oxidation to add carboxylic acid groups and then carbodiamide coupling with a dipic acid dihydroside. So this gives us our aldehyde and our hydroside modified CNCs, which can now be cross-linked together um, to produce some pretty interesting dried lightweight materials. So some, some aerogels that we've talked about before. Uh, and so making cross-linkable CNCs has been really crucial to work in my group. Um, where I won't go into the details, but we've used these cross-linkable materials to reinforce hydrogels um, in electrodes and current collectors for supercapacitors uh, in water purification. We've also used cross-linked CNCs to make direc directional scaffolds to grow muscles in one direction um, as bone implants uh, and to make cross-linked microparticles by using microfluidics as a processing method. So again, this is all surface modification in water to then allow for new processing techniques in water like the microfluidics and uh, new structures that we can build up with the cellulose nanocrystals. Another place where we've played around with chemical treatment as well as cross-linking, uh, this case is actually not using nanocellulose but using uh, sugarcane bagasse, so waste fibers. And in this case, we've shown that a little bit of pretreatment with sodium hydroxide and then cross-linking with citric acid and then oven drying, so really simple drying as opposed to, to freeze drying or some of the fancier methods allow us to get cross-linked fiber foams. And in this case, our covalent surface modification and the slight um, removal of lignin actually ends up giving a really patchy surface on the fiber where we have lignin patches and cellulose patches. And the combination of this chemical inhomogeneity as well as um, the imparted su surface roughness from the treatment and the surface roughness from the cross-linking and the drying allows us to make really lightweight materials that are naturally hydrophobic with a contact angle of around 120. And so these materials preferentially pick up oil and are uh, very lightweight and easy to dry just by slightly modifying the surface chemistry. So I think that's a, a neat example. Okay, so moving on to the, the last category, that's polymer grafting. A lot of work has been done in this area. There's a nice review by Yusuf Habibi uh, on polymer grafting with nanocellulose, um, but not very much done in water. We really wanted to work on this in water. And so um, we developed using sericum ammonium nitrate, um, which is a water soluble initiator and looking at free radical polymerization to grow polymers from CNCs in water. And we looked at pH responsive polymers like polyfluorovinyl pyridine, uh, thermal responsive polymers, polynipam, as well as hydrophobic polymethyl methacrylate. And all of those worked with this method. Um, and we were able to make some pretty interesting materials in water. Uh, but the key was is that we sonicated throughout the reaction to keep the materials separated. Otherwise, they agglomerated during the polymerization. So keeping everything moving helped us to not lose our CNC morphology. Um, we were able to make some switchable or reversible flocculants and to get fairly high surface modification with the polymers. But the issue with this method and using free radical polymerization is that 
we had about half of the polymer bound and half unbound. So we had a lot of free polymer, which was virtually impossible to separate. And so for some applications that might matter and for others not, um, but we did move away from water-based polymer grafting. And more recently, we've shown that with surface-initiated controlled radical polymerization with ATRP, um, that we can tailor the density of the polymer on the surface by changing the reaction media. And so the take-home message from this work here is that when you're choosing reaction media, if you can't work in water, and you have to choose, we looked at DMF, so a polar solvent, uh, and toluene, a non-polar solvent. And what you actually want to do is you want to optimize your solvent or your reaction media for CNC dispersion, not for the compatibility with your end surface chemistry. And so what we showed that was that with DMF in polar um, reaction media, we had about 30 times more polymer grafted and a much more hydrophobic material because we started with well dispersed CNCs. When we worked in toluene, even though it's highly compatible with the polymer, we aggregated the CNCs right away and then had um, low surface modification. And so um, we've showed that by changing the, the polymer graft length, graft density, um, that we can in incorporate these CNCs into some interesting systems. In this case, this is latex-based um, pressure-sensitive adhesives and coatings where the polymer grafting is necessary if you want to get the particles inside um, your polymer latex. And so uh, with that, I, I'm sure I'm out of time, but no one stopped me yet. Um, I really do appreciate the, the opportunity to speak today. I think this is a very exciting area of research and highly interdisciplinary. Um, by modifying the surfaces with polymers, covalent modification or adsorption routes, we can get new materials, new phenomena and enhance functionality. And that using nanocellulose in many different applications is gonna be really promising but we need to ensure uniform modification of individual nanoparticles and avoid aggregation. Uh, we want to either have no purification or uh, design methods that don't require purification. And if they do, make sure we've done it properly. Uh, and we wanna know what we've made. So thorough characterization always comes back high on my priority list. Um, and I think that all of these things are gonna be key if we talk about producing um, these materials on an industrial scale. And so with that, um, I really wanna thank um, Lars for the, the kind introduction to research and fiber for the invitation today. Thanks again, Neil Sifian, and uh, most importantly, my students, postdocs and collaborators um, that did all the nice work and some of my collaborators and funding um, partners are, are listed here. And so uh, with that, I'm very happy to take any questions and, and thank you for your attention.